And then now, I'm really happy to uh, introduce Mike Carmody to join us this morning. Last summer, we started a new series uh, called This Is Us, you might remember. Mark shared his story, I shared my faith story, Johanna shared her story, other Lakesiders did throughout the next few months. And this is a, a pop-up series that we are gonna be continuing from time to time where a Lakesider, one of you, will be able to, or if you want to, share your story, your faith journey. Because as I've said before, our faith journeys, our testimonies are living sermons. And so I'm excited that Mike is coming with us. He's the husband of Karen, the father of Victoria, Austin, Samara, and Denver. He's been on a journey with Jesus for five decades, and he's been here with us at Lakeside for three years. Mike is the former pastor, the executive pastor of Compass Point Bible Church, and he's currently the chief marketing and development officer at Children Believe, which is a not-for-profit organization, child sponsorship focused on education. And so he loves Jesus, and though we can't agree on blueberry sour cream donuts, we are a place of wide embrace, so we can still be friends. And so I'm thrilled to welcome Mike to the platform this morning. Thank you, Thank you, Mike. thank you. Good morning. So I have to address the donut thing really quickly. So if you were here a few months ago, Robin, our pastor who loves us, uh, told us about this new donut, that, or an old donut that came back from Tim Hortons, the blueberry cruller, was it, or blueberry? Sorry, sour cream, cruller. Okay, whatever. There was this new donut. And I thought, well, I gotta listen to my pastor. And so I went and got one, and, and what should have given it away was the fact that I threw my shoulder out when I picked it up. I've never eaten wet drywall, but I suspect this is what it tastes like. But forgiveness is part of who we are, and so I forgive. Uh, I'm excited, thanks for allowing me to kind of get up from my seat. We're right-siders, by the way, Ooh, go right side. Uh, get up from my seat and come and share a little bit about my story. Although I don't actually think I have a story necessarily. Stories have a beginning and end, or a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mine is really about a journey, like all of us, and it's a journey that I'm on uh, with Jesus and have been on for five decades, which is my cute little way of not really saying how old I am by letting you do the math. And so I'm happy to share it, but one of the, and I think actually the last 10 years of my journey are probably the most impactful, it certainly have been the most impactful for me, and I'm excited to share those pieces with you, but I do have to give you some of the backstory so you understand that. But the challenge I've always had, because I've been able to give my, my testimony, my story a number of times, the challenge I've always run into is how to start it because sometimes it feels a little egotistical, like I was born in a soft winter's day. Like it just feels like very much like you're talking about yourself, but it's also not a very exciting, dramatic start. Like Netflix will make a documentary, like I wasn't born in the middle of the night in the Venezuelan prison. Like I just don't have a start. I was born in Hastings, Ontario. Do people know Hastings, Ontario here? Oh, bless you, okay. I can't even call it my hometown because it's not allowed to be called a town, it was a village, it's very small. The population has said 1,000 for decades, we're rounding up from like 300, I think. It's a very small place. And it was actually my home base more than it was my hometown. We moved all the time, quite a bit. Between grades one and grade eight, I went to, I think, four different grade schools in three different provinces. And I loved it. I loved it. And the reason why I loved it is because I am something you call, which I just learned is a real thing, an attention-seeking introvert. I'm more comfortable right now standing here than I would be in like a smaller setting. For some reason, that's just the way I am because of my introvertness. If you had asked me to come into a room twice this side and say, hey Mike, can you just go up front and grab a mic and talk? Oh, I'm in my sweet zone. If you asked me to show up to that same room and mingle, oh, oh. Like my palms are getting sweaty just thinking about it. It's just not my, it's not my sweet spot. So as we moved around all the time as a kid, it was perfect for me. We often moved mid-school year, actually every time we moved. School year had already started, and so it was always the same. You'd show up, the, your parents would take you to the principal, and they'd cart you down to your new classroom. 
They'd open the door and the teacher would say, oh, kids, this is Michael, our new student. He's from Ontario. Ooh, like this exotic place that they'd never heard of. And I loved it. I had everybody looking at me, and it allowed me that, to go chase that thing that I thought that I needed, which was attention. And all my jokes were new, too, which made it really easy every time you moved. And so we did this multiple times. And then we'd go back to Hastings, and, hey, Mike's back, and he was in Alberta, and, oh, did you drive a buffalo to school? No, I didn't drive a buffalo to school. But you had this back and forth, back and forth, and it allowed me to, to really kind of chase that attention, which I thought that I needed. By the time I hit high school, we decided to move into Peterborough, go Pete's, and stay there. And so now I had to be in the same school, in the same community for five years. Five years, by the way, because back then there was a fifth year. It's not because of my educational deficiencies. You did a, what's called an OAC year. Anyway, five years in one community. And all of a sudden I was kind of stuck, but I found a loophole. It was a really big school, at least at that time, there was about 1,200 kids in that school, and I realized there were, as you all know, cliques in high schools different little groups of people, different little communities, so I could float. And I actually was pretty good at it. I could get along with the heavy metal guys with the leather jackets, like all summer long, leather jackets and ACDC t-shirts. So I could go and, and do my thing there and, and grab attention. I could go to the preppy kids who were listening to Depeche Mode and we put pins in our pants, if you remember doing that, safety pins, anybody? Gen X, no? You can Google it. I could hang out with the athletic kids because I played, played lots of sports. I could hang out with like the gamer, Dungeons and Dragons guys. It, just, it allowed me kind of to float around and seek that attention that I thought I needed. The challenge was the older I got, the more I realized it's not actually scratching my itch. There's something else missing. And where it really came to a head is one night, we went to a party. Uh, a group of people, and it was out of town, at a farm, had to, did our thing, had some fun, and we were driving back, it's probably 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and like every road in Peterborough then was a back road. Super dark, we stopped to, a few of us had to go to the bathroom, and I turned around and all I saw was taillights. They left me. It was a 20 minute drive to get where we were, so it was a very long walk home. And I remember, I can remember to this day, I can still close my eyes and see that moment. I remember thinking, this can't be it. It's got to be something else. And I had done so much to get the attention and approval of all these people. And I made bad choices. I drank way before I should have been drinking. And I centered people out. I bullied people. I did whatever I needed to do, I thought, to get the attention that I wanted, and it just wasn't working. And I was at a point where it's like, this, this can't be it. At some point after that, we were at our annual track meet in Peterborough. So all five high schools kind of descended on Trent University, and we went to the track for the day. And it was actually a lot of fun. Every school, there's five high schools in, in town, you kind of took a little spot, and you had blankets, sometimes some, some tents, and you'd be playing music. And I, music's a huge part of my life, like big time. All kinds of music. So at the time I thought, I, I kind of knew everything that was kind of hot and playing. And we're walking along, I was walking with a friend of mine, Terry, and I heard some music, I thought, I don't recognize that, that sounds weird. So I, I, well, it sounded good, but it was weird that I didn't know what it was, and I asked Terry and he started laughing. I'm like, what's so funny? He goes, well, it's Striper. I'm like, what? Never heard of them. He goes, oh yeah, they're a, like a Christian band. What? What do you mean? Like, you know, born again Christian, Christian band, evangelical, they sing about Jesus. Now, time out for just a second. This is mid-early 80s. So if you didn't have a faith community to be part of, your concept of what born again Christianity or evangelical, you, the only way you learned about it was on TV. We didn't have the internet. I'll let a few of you deal with that for a second. <laughs> no internet, no computers in our pocket. So you either read a book, <laughs> books were, yeah, anyway. <laughs> or you learned it from TV. And at the time, T 
TV evangelists were huge from, a, from an attention perspective, but I, forgive me, but I thought they were cuckoo for Cocoa Buffs. I thought they were the strangest people I'd ever heard. They were very charismatic, and, and the spokespeople at the time were guys like Jerry Falwell, Jim Baker, Jim Swaggart, who were surrounded by controversy. And everything seemed to be about money. And so when Terry goes, oh yeah, they're a Christian band, I thought, they make music? And then I was like, so you think those kids over there are one of those? He's like, yeah, probably. He goes, my parents are. Your parents? I had met his parents. They seemed so normal. I couldn't believe it. I, I was flabbergasted. I absolutely was. I was gobstruck. I just could not believe that they lived in the wild. <laughs> A couple weeks later, I'm on a bus, we were coming back from Kingston, we were at a rowing regatta, and I had started to date a girl, Sarah. And for some reason, I don't know how it came up, but I said, hey, by the way, did you know, you know Terry? His parents are, they're born again Christians. You already know where this story's going, don't you? She's like, yeah, yeah, so are mine. That's why her dad never liked me, by the way. I'm sure of it. I'd met her parents, I thought they were normal. And then she said the four words that you already know what she's gonna say. And so am I. In the words of Scooby-Doo, row, row, riggy. This was a problem. I couldn't believe it. There was one right beside me. And in the course of the next few months, Sarah and a dear friend of mine, Jason, who turned out to be one as well. They were popping out of the woodwork at this point. <laughs> they just loved on me. They shared their faith in a very non-threatening way, nothing like the TV evangelists that I saw. They met me where I was at and just shared their faith. They gave me Christian cassettes with lyrics and Bible verses so I could understand this book that we God, some of you are confused. Cassettes were little plastic rectangles <laughs> with a ribbon inside, and we put it in what's called a boom box. Took about 37 D-cell batteries, lasted 20 minutes, but you listen to music. That's what a cassette was. So I had this opportunity to start to understand and learn about faith, about Jesus, and they just met me where I was at. They played such a huge part in my understanding of Jesus. And can I just pause for a second? If you have people like that in your life who have played any kind of part in your walk, and if you're thinking of their names right now, can I, can I ask, can I beg, this week, thank them. Just reach out. Tell them that they played a part in your life. I reached out to Sarah about 10 years ago on Facebook. I hadn't talked to her in like 30 years, but I'm like, hey, I just need you to know you played a huge role in my faith life. And I'm so thankful that you did that. And she responded. She had gone through a, actually a difficult time in her own faith walk, and so I think it mattered. I think it meant something to her. I never got the chance with Jason. Jason took his life three weeks ago. And I don't want this to be a huge downer, but there's been more than one night in the last few weeks where I've laid awake thinking, man, I should have told him. So, if you can think of people in your life, can I just encourage you, send them a note, send them a text, do something, let them know. They had a huge influence and an impact on me. So much so that at some point, maybe a month or so later, again on a bus, it seems like everything with me happens on a bus, we're driving back from St. Catharines to Peterborough. It's the dead of night. Most people are asleep. Sarah was asleep on the seat that I was sitting beside her. I felt this overwhelming need to get on the floor, I put a coat over my head, and talk to Jesus for the very first time, really. And I talked to him about what I understood all of a sudden. I talked to him about the love that he has for me, and he talked back. I didn't hear his voice, but I felt him. You know, in some traditions, they talk about that moment, that born again moment, that was my moment. It was the first time I felt 
I received the love of Christ. I was so excited, I took the coat off my head. The bus wasn't levitating, there was no green light coming out of my fingers, so I felt pretty good. I woke up Sarah, I'm like, Sarah, I just talked to Jesus, I just talked to Jesus for the first time. And she kind of woke up out of one eye and went, oh yeah, and then rolled back to sleep. (laughs) Not exactly the poster moment I was hoping for, but that began a new part of my journey with Jesus. I used to think that's when my my, my journey with Jesus began. I used to think that was the moment, but the reality is Jesus was with me far longer, far before that. All those times when I was young, moving around, searching for attention, searching for acceptance, he was with me. This was just the moment when I accepted what he was already offering. I'd love to tell you that the three, four decades since then has been a cakewalk that it's been just this beautiful moment where I hear nothing but birds and, and angels and life has been perfect, but we know that's not the case, right? That's not what Jesus came for. Jesus came to be with us. And I have struggled. And one of the biggest things that happened early on, probably within the first year of being a believer, of, of experiencing the love of Jesus, is all of a sudden I found myself in this trap of trying to figure out the set of rules I needed to follow. First church I started going to, they're like, hey, by the way, you don't play cards. You can't play cards, it's really bad. I'm like, oh, kind of like playing cards, but okay. Oh, you can't, you can't see these movies. It was the 80s, there was great movies. You can't see these movies. Oh, okay, I, that seems kind of strange. And then past the rules came, hey, we believe this. We don't include these people because of this reason. And women don't speak in this church because of these three verses. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm no expert, and I'm new to this, but I'm reading this part, and that seems to be, seems to be different. And the biggest problem I had is that nobody let me ask the question. It was just, here's the set of rules. And I've spent probably 30 years trying to find the right set of rules because I thought that's what you did. To go find what is the rules that I can at least, that feels kind of right. And I turned my relationship with Jesus into a membership for decades. Man, it was a struggle. And there were times when I gave up and there were times when I just felt like it wasn't worth it. And these it's constant journey that I was on because somehow I couldn't find the right set of things. Instead of finding a place and a space, even in myself, to go, well, I wonder what that means. Because I read this here and I read this here and I, I forgot about the relationship piece. Even my prayers turned very academic. Not like that moment sitting at the floor of the bus. And it's really been in these last 10 years where I've started to... T- scale back from that, allowing myself. And here's the ironic part. Before I've allowed myself to explore it in a different way, I I worked for a church. I was on the pastoral staff, as you heard. And it became, that's when it really became difficult for me. Because I felt like, man, this feels more organizational. And I'm not, please, I'm, I'm not judging anyone. I suppose I'm being a little bit critical, but only because of the way it impacted me. I just needed a place where I could go, but but what about, and focus on my relationship with Jesus instead of this other thing. And it's been the last 10 years that I've been on that journey. It's why we're so thankful to be here. Can I just say that? So thankful for, for Lakeside a space where I can say, but I'm not sure I understand that, or that doesn't make sense. A place that encourages me to work on my relationship with Jesus, encourages us to work on our relationship with Jesus, to connect with Jesus. There's a a, a story in the Bible that, that really has been on repeat in my head for the last 10 years, and I love it. And I hope it's okay that I share it. It's, it's, it's a story around Peter, and I can relate so deeply to Peter. Not post-gospel Peter, like there's the Peter in Acts and that where he goes and he, you know, he's, he's the rock on which Jesus builds the church and he's, he's a passionate man for God, he's a great leader. I aspire to be that Peter, <laughs> but it's the gospel Peter that I 
find myself relating to more. Kind of a bumbler, right? A little bit of a goober. Spoke often before thinking. Was a bit quick-tempered. And there's this moment on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he's with the disciples and, and he's telling them, this is it. And, and they know, right? Like, this is not news to them. They've been following him. They've accepted him as their, the Messiah. So they know this is not anything new. And he's like, this is it. This, it's coming now. I'm going to be betrayed. It's time that the sacrifice I need to make happens now. And you're going to scatter. And you're going to be gone from me. And Peter feels like that's the right time to interrupt Jesus and tell him, no, 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 you got it all wrong. I'll never leave you. I would die before that. And he's like impassioned. In one of the gospel accounts, he's so impassioned that the rest of them join him. Like he's done such a good job in saying, Jesus will never leave you, even though they've been with him. They, like this is not a new story. But his emotion gets to him and he says, I, I would never do that. And of course, Jesus said to him, actually, you will. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter's like, no, I could never do that. And hours later, he does. Not days or months later. He didn't forget. Like, this would still be bubbling up. It was hours later, and he he did it. He denied him. Three times he's asked, and three times, no, I don't know that guy. No, I don't know that guy. And on the third time, the rooster crows, and he and Jesus lock eyes, and he is broken. He's broken. He, scripture says he runs off into the night, weeping, and no, like, no doubt. And we don't really hear about Peter or see Peter until this next piece that I just, oh. Peter and some boys are in the boat, and they're fishing. And there's a figure on the beach. There's a person on the beach. And he says, hey, you caught any fish? By the way, worst thing you can ask a fisherman. (laughs) Really bad. Have you caught any fish? No, we haven't caught any fish. We've been fishing forever. Oh, put your net on the right side of the boat. You'll catch fish. And of course they do, and they catch fish. And in that moment, this is not just a random story, right? This is how Jesus started his relationship with many of them. And they realize, and someone on the boat goes, it's Jesus. This is after Jesus' death and resurrection. They're like, it's the Lord, it's Jesus. And as the boat is heading there, what does Peter do? Do you know? He jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore. The same Peter that we last saw running into the night, weeping, broken. He sees the one to which he did betray and did deny. And he's so desperate to be with Jesus, he jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore. And then they have this beautiful, like, beautiful moment on the beach where Jesus sits with him and he says, hey, they're having like a little bit of a breakfast barbecue kind of thing. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, Lord, you know I do. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you? Do you love me? Lord, I love you. You know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And scripture says Peter's hurt at that moment. It's not out of spite or Jesus is not trying to rub it in his face, nor is it coincidence that he asks him three times. Peter's like, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus says, then, take care of my sheep. In that moment, in as much as Jesus is reconfirming Peter's purpose, he's really reconnecting the relationship. Peter, yeah, you denied me, like I told you you would. But Peter, this this relationship we have isn't about how you earn it. It's not about what you do to get it. It's not about you going to find it. It's about you receiving it. I love you, Peter. That's why he told him to throw the net on the other side of the boat. Remember our relationship. Remember how we started. There's two things I love about that story. One, just that, the the recognition of how Jesus is so desperate for Peter to feel love in spite of what happened. 
And that's what he wants for us, all of our journeys. You know, we talk about for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that's absolutely true, but sometimes I think we think about it about that God loved the world, like this big group of people. He loves that. But the reality is he loves us. He loves me, and he loves you. And how God can love everyone, I don't know, (laughs) but he does. And in that moment, that's what Jesus is really reconnecting with Peter. I love that part. And what I really love and why I can connect so well with Peter is when he jumps out of the boat. He jumps out of the boat. He's desperate in spite of what's happened, in spite of the confusion, in spite of where he's at in his journey. He jumped out of the boat because he was desperate to be near Jesus, the boat that was already going to the shore. And I can't help but wonder if we need to jump out of the boat more often when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. If there's not more of a need for us to forget the things that confuse us or maybe the, the challenge that you have right now in your faith walk, whatever that may be, or maybe you're in a beautiful place and thriving in your relationship with Christ, I can't help but think, I think we need to jump out of the boat more often because when we do that, we put the relationship first, not the membership. We make it about Jesus and then we experience him. I'm gonna invite Noah up to uh, create some space for us to think about that. And I, look, I don't know where you're at in your life and in your walk. I've shared a little bit about where I'm at or have been. Again, some of you are likely in a wonderful, beautiful place. You're feeling connected to Christ. You're feeling connected to God in a way that you never have before, and that's awesome. Celebrate that, rejoice in that. And can I say, we need to see that and hear that, so don't be ashamed. But others of us are in a more challenging part in our journey. A little rocky place, maybe, in the way we feel connected or not to Christ. And if we took the time right now to look around, just gaze around the room, or if you're at home, you can imagine that, I promise you, you would meet eyes with somebody who's in the same spot, or a very similar spot. And it doesn't disqualify us. It doesn't. We don't have to worry about the membership piece. We don't have to worry. It's good to learn, but it's more important to receive the love that Jesus has for each of us. So before I pray, just give us a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes. Just think about your relationship. Think about your, where you're at in your journey. Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity we have to pause and consider our relationship with you. We come here this morning in a variety of places. I've shared a little bit about my journey, but the reality is everyone here is on a journey and we're at different spots. And yet, here we are. You've gathered us together because you love us. God, I pray wherever we're at in our walk with you, that you would reveal yourself, nudge us with your spirit, help us to put aside the things that may be confusing or noise and instead focus on our relationship with you. Right now, this week, this month, wherever it's at, knowing and believing that it's not about us earning it, but receiving your love. God, I pray your spirit would just move among us. These things we pray because of who you are and in your name. And all God's people said, amen. There's prayer partners up at the front. It's one of those opportunities where you have to connect right now if you need to. They're there because they want to share and pray with you. So please take advantage of that. And I just want to bless you on your way out. I remember early on being in church and somebody said, oh, at the end we do a benediction. I'm like, I don't know what that word means. I don't know what that is. And basically it's a blessing. 
as we go from here, so this isn't just a moment and a participation, but it kind of fuels us as we go out. And there's lots of ways, different ways, different churches do it. So can I just say this? May you feel God's presence this week in a new way. May you feel the relationship you have with Jesus in a new way. And may you jump out of your boat this week, whatever that means. Be blessed, go in peace. And next week, we'll all be here again. Thanks for your time.